Hello, this is Anthony, and welcome to my first video in my series about porting to Python 3. This video aims to be a high-level introduction to Python 3, and won't attempt to go super in-depth on specifics for each topic. First, I'll cover some definitions. In this presentation, I'll discuss porting code to be Python 2 and Python 3 compatible. When I say Python 2, I'll be talking about 2.7. Earlier versions are missing some features we'll use and are no longer officially supported. For Python 3, I'll only be discussing modern Python 3, 3.3 and above, for the same reasons. I'll also refer to 6, a very simple Python library which aims to assist in writing 2 plus 3 compatible code. The first concept I'll be covering is the two types of strings in Python. The first is text. Text is a human representation of strings. Iterating through text gives you characters. String operations on text are meaningful. That is, slicing and replacing are both safe operations. In Python 2, the text type is called Unicode. In Python 3, the text type is called str. The other type is bytes. The bytes type is the computer representation of strings. Bytes have an encoding, which says how a character is represented on disk, or over the wire, etc. Iterating over bytes will give you a single byte at a time. String operations on bytes may not be meaningful, especially when dealing with multi-byte characters, as a string operation may mangle those. In Python 3, the bytes type is aptly named bytes. In Python 2, the bytes type is called str. For convenience, an alias, bytes, is available in Python 2 to assist in porting. When talking about string types, it is often useful to define a native string type. When writing string literals in code, the literals will assume the type of the native string. Most APIs in the standard library will operate on the native string type. In both Python 2 and Python 3, the type str is the native string type. Note from the previous slides, in Python 2 this is a binary type. But in Python 3, this is a text type. Next, I'll talk about an ideal application structure. An application will interact with interfaces to the outside world. These interfaces may be things like a network, a file system, a camera, etc. All of these interfaces at the core will speak in bytes. In order to talk to them, you'll encode data. Inside your application, you'll collect data from interfaces and perform business logic on that data. In order to use the data from the interfaces, which speak in binary, you'll need to decode to text. The best approach for handling this in an application is to convert to and from bytes at the application boundaries, and to deal with text internally. This task is pretty difficult in Python 2. We'll cover this more later in the presentation. Next, let's talk about porting strategies. The best approach I've found for porting code to be compatible is to take it in these four steps. First, make sure that syntax parses in both versions. This may mean changing some Python 2 specific syntax to be 2 plus 3 compatible. Once your syntax passes, make sure that your various linters also succeed. That is, your tools such as Flake 8 and Pilot return successfully. Once you're fairly confident in your static checks, you can move on to runtime checks. The easiest of these is to make sure that your code imports. The last thing to do is make sure that your tests pass in both versions. If you have a decently high test coverage, this should instill confidence that your code will work in production. Some of the new Python 3 features can be enabled in Python 2 by feature flags. These flags are enabled by magical from future import x imports at the top of a module, where x is the feature flag being enabled. Enabling feature flags are some of the easiest steps you can take to making your code 2 plus 3 compatible. One really nice thing about feature flags is they can be turned on in a per module basis, such that you can port portions of your code incrementally. The first feature flag we'll discuss is the Unicode literals flag. 
Earlier, I mentioned that string literals will assume the type of the native string. To recap, the native string in Python 3 is a text type. The Unicode literals flag changes the types of string literals in Python 2 to be Unicode. If you need to have a bytes literal, you can prefix the string with a B character, in the same way you would in Python 3. In a Unicode aware application, enabling this flag is usually pretty safe, but it is not possible to determine the safety of enabling this flag statically. The next feature flag is absolute import. Python 3 abolishes the implicit relative imports that could occur in Python 2. That is, imports must always start from sys.pathroots unless marked as explicitly relative by prefixing the module name with a dot. This means that import x becomes unambiguous and introducing a module cannot break other modules' imports. The safety of adding the absolute import flag can be determined entirely statically and is among the safest feature flags to add. Python 3 changes the syntax of printing from a statement to a normal function. Adding this feature flag enforces the usage of print as a function in Python 2. Importing this usually just involves adding some parentheses and occasionally using the file keyword argument. This feature flag can also be determined entirely statically. The last feature flag is division. In Python 3, division is floating point instead of integer division. This is by far the most difficult flag to use unless you know the types of your program very, very well. Fortunately, this also doesn't seem to come up that often unless your application is math heavy. If you need to explicitly do integer division, you can use the double slash operator. In Python 3, many modules which previously had non-standard names were renamed to comply with PEP8. Some other modules were rearranged to better group similar APIs. The easiest way to handle the moved modules is to import the names out of 6.moves instead. In Python 2, there were often two different APIs for several things, one which returned a list and another which returned an iterator or an iterator-like sequence object. Python 3 removes these redundant APIs, so things like xRange and iteritems are no longer a thing, and their corresponding functions now return iterator-like sequence objects. Generally, you should lean towards using the Python 3 names unless you are dealing with extremely performance-critical segments of code. For example, you generally shouldn't care about using the iter versions of the functions, unless you are dealing with structions that have billions of items. If you absolutely must, Six provides some helper functions to use these iterator-like objects in both Python 2 and Python 3. Next, let's talk again about string types. In Python 2, adding a str object to a Unicode object often just worked. This happened because Python 2 would implicitly convert between the two types using the ASCII encoding. This often led to code where it would work under test because the developer did not necessarily consider other locales, but would explode spectacularly in production. In Python 3, the bytes and text types are explicitly separated. If you try and mix the two types, you'll receive a type error as you should. In the same way that there's an explicit string type, the bytes type also changed. In Python 2, iterating a bytes object would yield one length bytes objects, but a bytes object in Python 3 is really just a sequence of integers. 6 provides some helper functions to enable the Python 3 behavior in Python 2. The standard library now requires text objects wherever possible, whereas it previously allowed either bytes or text, or sometimes required bytes. This makes it much easier to write a correct application which deals entirely with text internally. As stated earlier, the requirement of bytes by the Python 2 standard library made it much more difficult to write a text-aware application. Here's a quick cheat sheet on converting between text and bytes. Notice that it's pretty rare to use the Unicode or STIR functions anywhere and instead encoding and decoding is done explicitly. In Python 2, operations on file objects created with open return bytes. In Python 3, they will return text unless opened in binary mode. To enable the Python 3 behavior in Python 2, 
you can use the io.open function after importing io. Calls to subprocess always return bytes in both Python 2 and Python 3, though you could sometimes get away with not decoding the return value of subprocess in Python 2, it's important to decode it so you deal with text. In Python 2, the URL library spoke only in bytes, but the Python 3 libraries now correctly handle text and perform URL encoding using the UTF-8 codec. To enable the Python 3 behavior, you can install the third-party Yelp URI library, which handles this correctly. HTTP is a stream of bytes. In both Python 2 and Python 3, the low-level response objects will tend to hand you bytes. If you want to deal with text, I'd suggest either using a higher-level abstraction, such as the third-party request library, or being careful to decode responses yourself. Lastly, if you're reporting C Python C extensions, you may need to use the preprocessor to correctly handle the differences in C API between Python 2 and Python 3. You probably won't need to do this, but it's good to know that it's possible. Thanks for watching! A link to the slides will be in the description. Further videos in this series will focus on specific porting tasks. And as always, have a good one!